Welcome everyone to uh, the Aperio Lightning Talks this morning. I'm Neil Caden. I am with the Aperio Foundation. We have a lineup of uh, six speakers and each speaker will be given five minutes to present. We'll also have a brief introduction to the Aperio Farm concept by uh, Wilma Hodges uh, to kick things off. Uh, we'll save questions to the end. If we run into any audio issues, I may uh, go ahead and, and proactively mute your uh, connection. Uh, feel free to unmute at a later time. Um, for the presenters, um, thank you all for providing uh, PDFs so that while you're talking, there's some vi something visual to look at. And uh, you are welcome. Uh, if you want, I can share screen sh sharing with you, or you can just get through your slides or slide. And um, I think that about covers the logistics. Uh, the, this this uh, is being recorded, and we will go ahead and uh, see if anyone has questions first, and then we'll get started. All right, no questions, so we'll just go ahead and get started. So, uh, uh, William, Wilma, would you like to uh, kick off? Do you need uh, presenter permissions or just uh, voice? Just voice should be fine. Um, I'll keep it brief because it is a lightning talk. <laughs> so, um, just to kind of orient everybody to the idea of FARM, if you've not already heard of it, um, it stands for Funding and Resource Management, as we um, are showing on our lovely slide there. And um, basically, the idea is that if you have a project or even just an idea for a project to enhance any of the Aperio um, software platforms uh, that you can find other people to sort of connect with and grow your project um, via farm so we provide um, support and sort of a place to connect with other people in the community to um, get projects off the ground or um, gather additional resources and I'm going to just um, paste the farm website into the chat here. It's farm.aperio.org. Um, and feel free to go and, and look around and see um, if there's maybe a, an idea you want to pose. If you go over to the new development area, we have um, discussion areas uh, for all of the different Aperio projects. So um, if you had an enhancement idea for one of those projects, you could go into each of those and, um, and post your idea there and they can be um, voted up and people can comment on them to kind of see which ideas um, gather a lot of um, momentum that way. So um, anyway, so that is FARM. And um, we're going to be doing these lightning talks periodically to just kind of give people an idea of some ideas that are buzzing around out there. So um, uh, with that, I guess I will turn it over to Neil, who will um, introduce our first lightning talk speaker. Oh, I see a question in the chat. Sorry. Um, can we post projects related to incubation projects there? Yes. Yes. All of the um, Imperial projects, including the incubation projects, are represented. Yeah, and if they're, if they're not, we'll be happy to add you just in case we, we missed one, because I think there are some more recent um, incubation projects that may not have a space for um, creating those ideas, generating those ideas, and having the voting space. So if we need to, we can simply add that for you. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, Kyle, are you okay with being the first presenter today? Sure, why not? Okay, cool. Let me bring up your... Uh, just information here. <coughs> All right, go take it away. All right, sounds good. So I'm going to be talking about an idea to auto-publish courses in Sakai based on a, um, a course start date, basically. So you have a course template, you have a date you want it to start, and you can base dates on that to auto-publish. Uh, at Point University, we do things, we, we keep a master template for every uh, course that we run, and what we do is we import those into teaching shells every time that teaching shell is taught um, across six campuses with uh, two eight-week sessions in every uh, traditional term. Uh, we run a lot of courses over and over again. <clears throat> so this is something that people that 
duplicate courses based on a template or import from course templates may find very interesting or helpful uh, simply to cut down on some of the work. If you're not familiar with the import process after it's completed, what happens in that uh, when you're importing, say, from a master course to a new template is that every assignment, every forum, and every quiz basically is un becomes unpublished in the import process. So none of the forums, all the forums revert to a draft status. Uh, none of the assignments are published. And um, tests and quizzes don't have uh, published copies. They just have the working copies. And so you would have to go through and publish all of those again. Um, now, on the one hand, this is a very good thing because it makes teachers need to verify that everything is set up as they want it with the appropriate dates and everything. But what would make it much easier is if there was a way to set a course start date and make every or be able to auto publish everything based on the course start date. So, uh, for instance, we run our courses um, in an eight week model. So, you know, everything is due Sunday at the end of week one for for things that are due week one. And so you could set it up just by entering a course <clears throat> start date that it would make all of week one assignments due week <clears throat> week one mm -hmm. so on and so forth for the following weeks um, i think also in addition to a start date there would need to be um, a way to designate holidays uh, for instance, we sometimes have a week holiday in the middle of an eight week course. We wouldn't want the, we would want the dates to reflect that after the holiday. Um, and so I think this is just a really good idea to cut down on a lot of work for administrators and teachers that are uh, doing a lot of publishing courses from a massive template. And that's all I have. If anybody has any questions or additional points or discussion they want to add. Thanks, Kyle. I think the format we're going to try this time is to just go from one presentation to the other and then yeah. uh, take questions at the end. Um, so folks, if you have questions, feel free to put them in chat. We'll try and get back to them or, or uh, maybe write them down so you don't forget them. Uh, I see a nice comment from Adam that he thinks it's a brilliant idea. Um, and uh, so we'll, we can come back to that later. So thank you very much. Appreciate it, Kyle. No problem. Uh, next up on the lightning talks is uh, Andrew. So Andrew, let me bring up your slides and then give you presenter permissions. Hold on just a second here. Okay, I think I successfully unmuted, which would probably help. Yeah, and let's see, and here is presenter permissions. Fantastic, I'll start my, start my five minute timer so I stay within. So uh, I have five minutes to tell you about uh, GitHub pages and how awesome that can be for project documentation. So here we go. Um, uh, this lightning talk is up on the web at that URL. I'll end with that as well. So if anyone wants to jot it down and, and you'll have it again. Uh, here we go, five minutes. So so what problem are we solving? Uh, well, your project you know needs to have a website, you know, preferably a good website, preferably a cheap website, because none of our projects have you know, too much resources, too many volunteers. Um, this needs to be sustainable, because if you're going to have a website, you should probably keep it up to date. Um, and it needs to be low risk. You know, we, we don't want to be incurring a bunch of technical debt so that, you know, darn it, we're going to have to redo this whole thing again, and it's going to be expensive later. Uh, so you know, projects need websites, and we need to be able to you know, cheaply and sustainably do this. Uh, so GitHub Pages is websites for, for individual people, for organizations, uh, and especially for projects. It's hosted by GitHub. It's generated by a thing called Jekyll. And, and this is a solution to that problem of websites for projects, where the source code for the website is in uh, the GitHub repository. Um, you know, as a software as a service thing, uh, GitHub generates from that source to your website, and then they host the resulting website. And uh, that's pretty cool. This has got a lot of free to it. It's cheap. 
uh, as in they're not charging you anything for it. Uh, it's free as in a free puppy in that if you want to dig into Jekyll and, and dig into all the power of this, there's there's lots to, lots to adopt here. Uh, but it's also free in the sense of a dog sitter in that you don't have to do all that because uh, what GitHub really wants to do is just run Jekyll for you and you can focus on the content of your website. Uh, and it's free as in an escape route in that this is all open source software. So if you decided you didn't like GitHub, um, or if you know they realize that they can't keep losing money forever, uh, you could take your website and go generate it somewhere else and host it somewhere else and not not really have to start over. So that's pretty cool. Um, what features do we have? Well, uh, the simplest thing you could do is you could just dump some HTML into a directory and ask GitHub to host it for you. And that's cool. You're done. And there's lots of ways to produce HTML. You can lovingly artisanally produce HTML um, and, and life's good. So that's a solution. Um, and of course, by doing this, you still get some goodness uh, because you're using Git. Git is nice. You get versioning, you get history. Um, but uh, we can go further, right? Instead of having to compose HTML you know, by hand or in some other way, uh, there's this tool called Jekyll. It's a static site generator. The idea is to separate the content from the presentation so that uh, the documentation can be uh, in a text that's really about your content, that's you know paragraphs and bullet points and images and all that good stuff, and then you know source code, and then the tool generates the website you know, from that, uh, and that ends up being really nice. And so you go look at something like you know right in Imperio oeproject.org. Uh, it's an attractive website. It's got kind of a blog thing going on, and um, and if you go look at the source code of that, the structure's pretty reasonable. You can see how you would add a new new blog post without um, without really having to know a lot of HTML or, or really be a web developer. Um, and that's because of, among other things, this support for Markdown, where, where if you take this far enough, you can write something that that you know is really this cute text file format uh, rather than than being a lot of you know HTML markup. Uh, and then, of course, you know, by using GitHub for this, we get GitHub collaboration, we get branching, we get merging, we get pull requests, we get collaboration. Uh, but the killer feature, the point of my talk, is that you can put the source code of the website in a docs directory with the thing being documented. And this is what makes the documentation sustainable, because then in the same breath, in the same transaction, where you're um, adding a new feature or fixing a bug or changing the, the product being documented, you can also update the documentation. And that seems to me to be a good way to make sure to not leave documentation updating to the end of your project. Um, there's a web-based tooling. So you know, for people who, who you know, don't want to be pulling down the text files, that's OK, too. Um, we get a lot of advantages of this uh, in terms of sustainability and transparency and you know, where did this website come from and who did this and when did this and why did they do this. Uh, this is really a pretty nice solution for websites for projects. And so there's a bunch of examples in Aperio um, that you can take a look at and you can try it out and you can get my slides there at the URL. I'm out of time. Amazing timing, great, great timing there. Nicely done. Uh, okay, super, thank you. I'll take presenter permissions back and we'll go to our next uh, speaker, uh, which who would be Bruce. So Bruce, I'm gonna bring up your slides uh, and then I'm going to give you presenter permissions here. Thank you. Let's see, do I have those controls? You will write. There we go, you should I got them. Right now, yep. Okay, great. Thanks, folks. I want to tell you about a incubation project. This is called Image Quiz, and um, it's standalone software right now. And we're hoping eventually to get it LTI compliant. And so that's one of the things I want to ask for at the end is if there's people who are interested in working on LTI compliance for this. But let me a little bit tell you a little bit about what it does and about what we have achieved with it. So. We um, have done, I guess there's two things I want to say. Everything I'm going to tell you today is very strongly based in cognitive psychology. So pretty much every point that I make, we could go on and almost an hour talk on that point about the research that's been done to show that those things work. But we've also tested the software in a real classroom situation. I'll tell you about the learning domain we did that in in just a minute. Just look at the results here first. So. Um, 
this is, we tested the software, we trained the software at one level. So this is like if we had to, um, if we want to ask people to learn the, not using these controls, right? Okay. This is as if we learn, ask people to learn the identification of the members of a family, like your family. So let's say Wilma, Neil, and Kyle have all have 10 siblings, and we asked the students to learn five of them. And we, then we tested them on that, and we see with our software, we did 25% better with the photographs of them, and 8% better if they actually looked at the people, and all, even if we just written a, wrote a description of them. But it's not just that we did better with the software than traditional ways of studying. We did better if they were exposed to the other members of those families. So let's say we had exposed them originally to five members of Wilma's family. We've got five members they've never seen, five members of Neil's family they've never seen. We ask them to put them into the correct family after we've shown them the pictures of those unknown people, and they do better after the software. So not only do they do better both on what they knew things that they things that they've seen, but they do things on better that they haven't seen. That learning is retained. So here's at the exam time, we have a very large difference. Six months later, we bring them back and that difference re is retained. They do much better after the software. Software works very simply by what I call the learning circle. This is oversimplification, but they see an image. They, uh, the image disappears from the screen. They have to type the name of that image and then they get feedback immediately. If they get it wrong, they get to do it again. We can do that learning circle with the software up to about 10 to 20 times a minute. And that's why it's one of the reasons it's so is expensive, be expensive, effective, because there's so many repetitions. OK, so these aren't pictures of people we're looking at. This is as if this was Wilma's brother George here. So George, you see, is not one picture of George. This is a species of plant. They see all of these pictures. They've got to recognize it all at George. They've got to tell it apart from Tim and any other brother she might have. So it's a very difficult kind of task we have them doing. Not only can they do organism identification, they can do things like earning, learning artistic styles. So if you want them to know the difference between um, cubism and expressionism, you might train them on not just five or six pictures here, but you might do 20 pictures of a, of cubism, and you would find then afterwards they are much better able to see kind of works of these proto-cubists here and analyze what those proto-cubists are doing, or perhaps also even determine that that's kitsch, then it tell you why that's kitsch. And they're doing that because they've built up a mental model of what cubism means. They can also pick out individual parts of images. So this is um, looking at functional groups in organic chemistry, and the software is used at my university in this way. The students have to pass a test at the very beginning using this software. They have to identify these images based on the functional group. These are all amine groups, and they have to do that at one-tenth of a dissection display time. So that's one of the unique things about the software, very short display times on these kinds of things. So where do we need to go with this? Some of the software is already up on GitHub as um, open source. Some of it is not. We have a C++ version of the software. We need, a, I'm not a programmer myself. We need a developer who will help get that up and open source. It's ready. It just has to be gone over and get into the right format. And then uh, <clears throat> we could then also put up a number of the versions that are ready for distribution, like that amino acid program is ready to distribute right now could be being used in organic chemistry classes around the world, but we don't have a GitHub site set up for that yet. We also would like, as I say, to get LTI compliant. So we're looking in the longer term to redo the software in a way that it could integrate with any learning system. I think I'm out of time. Uh, yeah, I gave you a few extra seconds if you wanted it, but that's cool because <laughs> you were having trouble with the controls. But that's, t that's perfect. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Um, OK, so let's see. Next up on our list will be uh, Martin Ramsey. So let me get you your slides up here, Martin. All right, let me give you controls. Where are you here? Scroll down. There you are. OK, let me know when you're starting, and I'll start the timer. All right. Um, I'm going to be talking about skins. Um, 
and just sort of a focus on that. But before I tell you about what we are trying to do there, I want to, I have to tell you a little bit about the LAMP consortium because this is important and how this project sort of unfolds. We're a group of 25 colleges and universities and so forth um, that share, and this is the important thing, a single instance of Sakai. And what's important to know about that is that every one of those members needs their own skin. Um, we used to specify them in Sakai 10 and prior with a custom CSS, um, but it's, in, it's, it's critical for them to be able to brand them. In fact, you see Point University that Kyle just talked about them. Um, they're, they're a member and so you know their courses need to say Point University and they need to have their Point University color scheme and so forth. So um, you know that's kind of where we were. What we used to do is um, we just had an interactive PDF form and let people say, all right, I'm going to give you an image file that has my logo in it. I'm going to tell you what color I want the sites buttons to be. I'm going to tell you what colors I want the tool menu to be on the left hand side. And that's basically how we did it. You know, it wasn't very complicated, but what was what was important is that we had to build a custom CSS. So when we went uh, to Sakai 11, which I just realized tomorrow will be the one month anniversary for us having upgraded to Sakai 11, um, we, I learned that skins are now being specified by parameters because of the Morpheus project, which is fabulous. Um, and that gave me the, the idea that, hey, we can drive these multiple skins with a set of parameters. Um, and so 25 skins, which sometimes need to change because branding changes or color schemes changes or whatever. It's like, this is a fabulous idea. I'm really, was really excited about that. Um, but when it came down to it, this is what the parameters looked like. And I have to admit that I was kind of intimidated and I couldn't always figure out what those different colors did and all that kind of stuff. Um, it, was, uh, it was kind of rocky. And so um, what we did was we built a, a web app that basically lets people specify the same kind of stuff we had been specifying before. You know, there's that left-hand tool menu, there's the course buttons, but you'll see there's a whole lot of other stuff that we found out we had to specify too because of um, the, well, let's say the complexity of the, the Sakai 11 skins. And by the way, just as a parenthetical comment, we, we allowed people then to upload their own logos and we also added the good work that was done by um, Oxford there, the quick links, thank you, Adam and, and company. Um, that, that we put that in the skin. So the idea is that our users can specify their skin colors on this uh, form right here and magic. Um, here's that form right here. People manage that. We export nightly three different files. One contains the skin parameters, one contains the logos, and one contains the quick links. Um, and, and that gets imported by Longsight, our hosting company, into Sakai. And so the users can see these new skins uh, and, and people can basically manage those. And so instead of compiling CSS and all that kind of stuff um, and things that were pretty complicated to do, now people can just say, I want this color to be here. Um, so uh, the, the problem is, and this is, this is where this is the project comes in, the number of skins, I think the parameter, the number of parameters is rather excessive. Um, there are a lot of different types of objects that can be controlled and, and they're not always well-defined. Frankly, they're applied inconsistently. We've spent since about June chasing these down, trying to figure out what they are. Um, and perhaps the most troubling one of all is that the different tools follow different rules. Um, so once something works in calendar, it doesn't necessarily work somewhere else. Um, and, and I sort of feel like we need a comprehensive design standard. Uh, that's kind of where we are. So uh, let me give you four examples. Here is um, the Brevard skin. You can see these are called tabs apparently. And so here's the selected tab. Here's a non-selected tab. Here's the mouse over. Um, and it's, it's really it turns out to be quite difficult. You can see that the color scheme right there isn't working very well. The contrast isn't high enough. That wouldn't actually uh, pass muster for accessibility. Here is uh, the Johnson University skin. There's a calendar entry right there. You can't see it. It's white on white. Um, and finding the parameter that drives that turns out it's not any of the standard parameters that you might think it was. Here's another example on a mobile device. Uh, this is from Point University. See those two buttons right there? Can't see them, they're invisible. And in fact, the text uses what's called background color and the fill uses a, a tool menu color, which is a text color. So they're flip-flopped. Um, so there's some, some issues there. Um, and then here's another one. Here are some tabs, this is from the Lise McRae skin. Here are tabs up here and here are tabs down here. Where's this blue color come from? Frankly, we haven't found it yet. 
um, we're, we're still kind of struggling. I don't know, know why this doesn't look like this, but it doesn't. Um, okay, I'm told I have to go. So here's my proposal that we've got lots of things to do uh, to, to basically fulfill the promise. Uh, we've got wonderful things happening, but it's not as um, far along as it ought to be. So I'll be quiet now. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, very cool. So the next uh, next up is uh, Louisa. So Louisa, give me a chance here to uh, get your slides showing, and then I will hand the reins over to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lessons. And there we go. So let me All right. List okay. here. Let me give you. Let me give you presenter permissions before your time starts here. Okay. Now you've got presenter permissions, so you should be able to go on the slides and start any time. All right. My clock starts now. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so uh, you can see that I'm talking about lessons in Sakai 11 and beyond. Uh, to be honest with you. I don't have a well-planned project at this moment. I'm an instructional designer. Uh, we don't have a developer to work on these lessons. I'm mostly um, gathering ideas now and see if community could do something together. Uh, if the farm project could um, help um, gather around a group of people and work on this. All right. So, uh, so currently, I'm thinking uh, due to the release of Sakai 11 and even Sakai 11.2, uh, um, the tool itself is really great. I like it a lot. Uh, to work on some enhancement, I think we have three areas to look at. Interface, tool integration, and student data. Uh, in terms of the interface, I think we have improved so much that we probably only have a couple of uh, small fixes and bugs here and there to work on. So uh, I think it's a low priority. Um, the new tool, the section title, just came in 11.2. I think we're still going to test it out and see if there are any small bugs here and there. Um, so in terms of tool integration, I think we have a couple of things we definitely need to work on. I hope that we could uh, improve that very fast, you know, uh, Maybe in uh, in June we can have a couple of things done. Um, two things I think need to uh, get fixed or improved are for tests and quizzes and the student content. Um, and you can see that for the tests and the quizzes here, um, I really hope that it could work as well as the assignments. Uh, right now, students cannot see a lot of things, cannot see feedback, cannot see grades, uh, cannot see their multiple submission results. Uh, it's uh, unfortunate. Uh, the faculty have to have the test and quiz tool open so that the students can see their grades. Um, for the student content, uh, one weird thing that I discover is that when a student uploads content, it goes into their uh, home uh, resources folder and it's called a stuff four. Uh, it's misleading and the things would uh, jumble together. It doesn't encourage the use of student content at all. So I hope that we could figure out something. So these could be feature requests. Uh, a couple of other things that we have uh, considered will be the uh, page history revert to previous version. Uh, I think you can, if you use any Google Docs or uh, Wiki pages, uh, you can understand those. You know, if we want to go back, you know, we work on the lessons pages so much. Uh, if we want to go back, especially the student pages, and would these be the uh, uh, in very important features in student pages, especially if we have a group working on these? Um, uh, these could be potentially important features. Now, uh, last but not least, this is actually uh, my top of priority here because we have improved so much on the interface and the tool integration i think it's time that we could work on these now um for tracking and reporting at the moment the only thing we have are the side statistics so if you go to the side st statistic you can see the um uh, the 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 lessons page uh you can do it by 
uh, by data. Let me see if I could increase a little bit. Okay, so you can do it by date, by user, and by page. Uh, so and as good as they are, uh, I think the uh, faculty, especially the faculty for online courses, are looking for more than that. And they are looking at the page view, the item completion, because there will be multiple items on one page. Uh, the page view doesn't actually tell you anything. The progress bar, uh, I have seen a progress bar uh, pr uh, demo in one of the um, presentation in the Perry conference. I have to go back and find that and the time clock. And for reporting, I hope that we could have better analytics on those pages. So really, the if you run an online course, especially a self-paced online course, uh, really we rely on the reporting a lot to manage the students, monitor their progress. Thank you. That's it. Uh, the, yeah, so yeah, uh, the Adam, the progress bar, I know it's in the semigo, but the, I have seen one institution have the progress bar in lessons. Okay, I'm going to take back presenter and uh, for our final presentation, last but not least, our final presentation today, Miguel Carro. And let's find his talk here. Let's see, I know I've got it uploaded. Uh, it was the Mobile Connect authentication. That's the one. All right. And now, Miguel, let me find you and give you presenter permissions. There you are. Okay. Go whenever you're ready. Hi. Hi are you there? I can't hear you right now. No? Can you hear me? I can. It's breaking up a little bit. I think I have a problem with my mic. Yeah, so, it's a little bit of an audio problem there. No? Hmm. This is the no. worst kind of problem. Yeah, I can hear you. It's just it's just kind of very choppy. I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, if I was able to, to listen, uh, I will show you. Uh, oh, if you want, we won't start your timer yet. There is a call-in number, but I know you're also in Spain, so I don't know if that will work for you. Um, uh, do you know about the call-in number? No. The phone dial-in? I can give you the phone dial-in, but I don't want to have you incur a lot of charges. Um, I'll paste it in here in case you think it might work for you. There is isn't, uh, you know, uh, so let me know if you want to do that or just go ahead and do the best you can with the microphone you've got right now. Either way. Yeah, I'll try, I'll try, okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about a new possibility for, for Sakailami. Okay. Uh, there is a new uh, specification called Mobile Connect okay, that uh, allows uh, to log in multiple websites without using the username and, and, and the password. Okay, it's Miguel, you want to try leaving and coming back in? We'll wait for you. Okay, everyone, so we're waiting for Miguel. So anyone know any good jokes? I know I don't. Laura can attest to that. <laughs> so we'll just uh, give Miguel a couple minutes to, uh, to jump back on here and hopefully his audio. When we first started the, the, um, the check earlier before the conference started, um, it went, uh, his yeah. audio sounded great. Oh, I see there is a joke going on. Okay, so Randy writes, what's a pirate's favorite letter? Now it's much better, the audio? Oh, the audio, much better. Yes, terrific. Let me give you oh. per, um, presenter permissions. The, the, magic of, the, the magic of refreshing, okay? Yes, yes. Hold well, on a second. I'll give you presenter permissions, and we will start your five-minute timer. Um, I know there was a joke in there somewhere. I missed the joke. That's okay. We were, we were kidding around while you were off to entertain ourselves here. All right, here's the presenter permissions and take yeah. it away whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, I will start again uh, a bit fast because I think I lost a bit minutes. Yeah, well, no, 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 no. we'll start, start over with the time. You, you have a fresh five minutes now. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about a new technology in order to log in in Sakai. 
without sharing the username and the password. Okay, it's a new technology that most of the important carriers or operators all over the world will implement in the future. As far as I know, uh, some uh, portals and, and also banks will implement this kind of login. Okay, it's simple, it's private, and it's secure. If you want more information, you can go through that links, okay? It doesn't require to install a separate uh, uh, application and is available for all mobile operator, operating systems. Uh, works like uh, you will find a new button in order to connect your account using your mobile phone. You can share your, your mobile number, then um, you will receive uh, an aut authorization uh, in, in your mobile. And then if you grant access to the application, you can log in uh, without uh, sharing the username and the password. Uh, we've done a pilot in Spain for a virtual uh, university and the users now can log in using their mobile numbers uh, once their account is associated. So they don't need to share the username and the password again. Now it's only available for one Spanish operator or carrier because uh, this project started as a proof of concept, but we're pretty but we're pretty uh, comfortable that should work for, for other carriers, okay? Uh, this is an example of how it works. Uh, we, the, the image on the right side uh, is, is the Sakai login, a bit modified, and appears a new option to, to log in using the Mobile Connect technology. Then uh, the user inserts uh, his or her phone number instead of the username and the password. Then, as you can see in the right image, appears um, an, a dialogue, a confirmation dialogue, in order to grant access to, to the server. And finally, the user is logged in. So uh, the user only needs to associate his or her number phone at the first time, and then the his credentials are not able to, to to share it again. So now it requires changes over the login tool. Our uh, current version only supports one operator and we want to implement multi-carrier in, in the future. Now uh, uh, the development is disabled by default. And I, don't, I don't know if the community is interested in having this because um, requires some uh, some configuration uh, of the carriers and a uh, small commercial info i come from entorno de formacion uh, a spanish company and if if everyone is interested in, in know more details about this they can ask in that email address thank you so much thank you miguel uh that uh, very nice and really appreciate it Great presentation, and it does look interesting. So I'd like to, I don't know, let's give a big virtual round of applause to all of our uh, presenters. Um, I've seen a lot of great uh, chatting in the, uh, in, the, in the chat. There's a lot of great conversation going by. I wish we had a good way to capture it. When we move this uh, um, video over to YouTube, for some reason between Big Blue Button and YouTube, we lose the chatting part of it. Um, so I'll open it up. We have. Uh, about 15 minutes or so uh, where we can just open it up to questions uh, for any of the presenters. Um, I had a couple questions, but I will hold on to mine and see if anyone has. So just let us know what the question is. You can either type it or, you know, turn on your microphone. And um, I can save as a transcript, uh, Martin. I'm not sure exactly how we, you know, uh, it doesn't, I don't know how we would kind of sync that with a YouTube video though. Um, yeah, we could potentially do that. We could potentially, well, I'll go ahead and, and copy and paste what we've got so far. Let's see, let's see if I can get in there. I'm on Chrome, copy all text, it's Command C, and let me see if I can save the chatting. Useful. Yep. Okay, so I saved the chatting. Uh, so go ahead and any questions that folks have, and we'll just open up the floor.
And Andrew said, we'll just have to start up lively discussion on the YouTube videos once they post. That's actually a really cool idea, Andrew. Um, that gives me some, some ideas, but uh, uh, I will hold them for now. But that's actually, I think, really cool. Uh, Martin says, I usually save the chat as a transcript and the attendees, just for the record. It's a good idea. I'll have to figure out where to save it so it's connected up. Any other, any questions about the particular presentations? I saw, of course, a lot of questions and comments fly by in the chat. If not, we can always uh, end a few minutes early, which is totally fine, but uh, just give uh, people a few minutes to think about whether there's any specifics. And I'll, like I said, I actually, I'll kick it off because I do have a couple questions. So one is for Andrew. Um, I'm curious because I started looking into the GitHub pages versus the GitHub wiki, because we are heading that, you know, that way of taking um, at least the Kai technical documentation, if not more, and moving it over onto GitHub so we can manage that better. Um, did you compare at all the GitHub built-in wiki versus GitHub pages? And, you know, I was a little intimidated by the amount of effort uh, to use GitHub pages, but maybe I just didn't get into it enough. I would never use the GitHub wiki for any purpose, which is strong, but maybe it's the right way to phrase that. Um, the killer feature, the, the, the key feature, is being able to update documentation in the same transaction with updating the thing being documented. And, and until recently, this you know, was actually a pain because of some details in GitHub Pages implementation. And the, the brilliant giant step forward is that you can now uh, just simply have a directory named docs you know, in your master branch right there with your with your software and tell it configure it in the in the repo settings that's the source for my github pages site and that that little detail has made it possible uh, to to trivially to very easily um, have the source of your of your website um, in with the thing being documented and so if a sakai tool you know was documented in this way, uh, then in that same change set that um, you know adjusted the way some feature worked could also be included the the adjustment to the documentation to reflect that. Wow, that sounds really cool. Uh, is it okay if I follow up with you outside of this meeting for a little more information? Absolutely, we should. Um, you know, in the U Portal project, we've been wrestling with this for you know probably years in not getting off the dime and doing it. Um, you know, that technical change was, you know, what allowed us to turn the corner. Um, it turns out if you really naively just start dropping um, markdown files in that docs directory and tell it to build it, it will do its best. I mean, you don't have to configure Jekyll. You don't have to pick a theme. You end up with a website that's kind of ugly, but but it, it works kind of out of the box. It's really pretty neat. Cool. Cool, thanks. I see there's some questions in the chat for image quiz. There's one from Louisa and one from Pat. So why don't we do a couple of uh, questions on the image quiz? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. Oh, I see the oh. questions are right in there. Uh, go ahead and, and and state the questions out loud, Bruce, so that they're recorded, and then go ahead and answer oh, them. What maybe should maybe the questioner should state them. I'm don't want to put words in your mouth, but I could say first of all that they're standalone programs, and the images are integral to the programs that exist right now. They're not integrated with Sakai at all at this time. But why don't you elaborate the people who wanted to ask the questions, Louisa and... Yeah, and some of them may be like on just speaker only and can only put it in chat, so... I see. Um, I, I can uh, elaborate on my question. Okay. Uh, so now I understand that uh, your image quiz is a standalone application. So I guess the image will be saved in this applications so eventually if you think you want to integrate uh, your image quiz app in sakai uh does it work with a semigo at all or is it a standalone so your image quiz is does it only have images question type or does it have everything no it's just images so it was it was made to work with visual learning and so it only works with images now. It doesn't work with text or anything else like that. It, this was all done, it was all started, oh, I don't know, more than 10 years ago, and were developed as independent programs and then only came into Aperio as an incubation project about a year ago. And since that time, a lot of things have happened and there hasn't been a, a, enough work on the program so that all we've been able to do so far within a within Aperio is get one version of the program up. So there's actually two 
completely different versions of the program that do very similar things. One is written in Java. The source code for that is already up. And that was the one that I talked about where you looked at uh, families, where you could look at different hierarchical levels of images. And so that's very useful in my field of biology. There's another version that's written in C++. It's a little simpler in what it does than what the Java program does. The Java program is very sophisticated in the kinds of things that it'll do. It's even got a kind of a scripting language built in it, so you can write your own kind of uh, your own kind of study sessions for the students. The C++ version doesn't have that, and uh, that is not up on GitHub now. The software is all open source, but there's no way to, to really get it unless you were to write me and to get and to get the individual thing. Same for the executables. Mm -hmm. So now there's these two different versions. But then within each version, the Java version and the C++ first version, there's multiple kinds of possibilities there in each one. So with the Java version, we've got something that teaches herpet herpetology, snakes and reptiles and those kinds of things and, rep and recognition for those. We got, we've got a version that's being used in Australia for agricultural plants in southeastern Australia. We've got a version that's used in the southeastern United States for things. So and that's just a matter of switching the images in there. And it's relatively easy to do that. No programming experience is needed to do that. On the C++ side, got versions that I use in my class. I teach different things about plants. And we've got several versions for that. We've got a version for organic chemistry. We could easily make many other versions. It's even easier to add your own images there. But they are. once you add the images, you've created a new version of the program. There's no exchange of images between the different versions. There's no web component to it. I mean, for a while, I thought that was really bad. But with all the hacking now, maybe it's good that we don't have any web interactivity. But anyway, that's going it needs all to change in the future. We do need to get LTI compliant and get it integrated with other kinds of things. Yeah, that, I understand that, that that may mean that we have to rewrite a lot of the code. Yeah, I'm wondering, Bruce, if you need to be a web application in order to take advantage of LTI. I would presume so, but I don't know 100%. Yes. Um, I don't know either. So there's another version of the software that I haven't talked about that we call Image Sort, and it allows you. It's all that is all web-based. It's all JavaScript, and um, it runs in a browser. And in that version of the image, you have you display a set of images at the top of the screen. And the students then have to sort them out based on the characteristic that you want them to find. So if you had five different versions of amino acid functional groups in there, or just functional groups for organic chemistry in there, you had the images for all of those, the students would have to sort them out by which functional group goes with which. They end up in five different boxes in the lower part of the screen. And then they hit a button and they get a grade on that. They can get a grade on that. And that would be perhaps a place to start with LTI integration. That also, the software for that is easier, but it's not on GitHub, but it really just needs to be put on GitHub because it's all out of the box, source code and executable code in one. Okay, cool, thanks, thanks, Bruce. Uh, I see some other questions have come in. I think I saw one fly by uh, about uh, GitHub. I had a question for Miguel quickly on the authentication because I saw something fly by. I don't know if it got answered around. Is the authentication that you're talking, the mobile authentication, is that anything like two-factor authentication or just a different way of authenticating? I think it's quite different than two-factor authentication. Okay. I think in two-factor authentication, you need to share your credentials. So also, you need to confirm using a message maybe a code or something like that, that you will receive as, as SMS. But this doesn't require um, a message because uh, the application is installed in, in your SIM card. Hmm. OK, cool. Thank you. Hmm. Um, I think there was a question on GitHub. Did I see one fly by from Matt Clare? It's hard to keep track of all these uh, questions here. Yeah, I was just wondering if uh, GitHub Project Pages makes it easier to create a list of uh, related Ethereum GitHub project pages, you know, as a hierarchy or directory. Not really. Um, you can use GitHub Pages for um, organization-level websites, but the keeping around the the links to the 
to the other websites would be rather manual. Um, the GitHub pages website, you know, if it exists for any given um, repository, is predictable from the name. So you, so you can kind of know how to go look for them. Um, the, the, maybe the one feature I'd offer for this is in GitHub, you know, on the metadata for a repository, you get to have a little pithy description and you get to have a URL. And it's very common as a pattern to set that URL to the GitHub pages site. And if you do that, then GitHub will roll that up in a lot of the places where it references that repo. Okay, that's the start of a solution. Thanks. Cool, thanks. Um, so again, I might be missing some folks' questions. Um, please repost the, at the end of the chat if you had any, or just turn your microphone on if you have audio and, and ask away. Neil, I can, can I say something very fast, yeah. very quick? Sure. Yes, we have been seeing these talks and they are, everyone is very interesting and truly everyone here wants to have this working in their systems as soon as possible. But the idea of these talks is not only to view them and say, that's nice, and forget when you finish. What you need to do now, and I'm talking not for the speakers, I'm talking for the people watching, is to think if you have any resource or any kind of help, maybe a person that can work five hours on these ideas, or maybe um, an instructor in your university that use the, the students to make projects, and you can say, hey, you, can your classroom work in this project? I don't know, interns or money to pay. If you have this and you think that this idea is interesting, you should contact the, the person that has presented the idea and, and try to work with him. The idea of this presentation is to find people that collaborate in these ideas, not only to listen to good ideas and forget after that. Thank you, uh, thank you, Diego, for that reminder. That is a big part of what this, uh, these talks are about, is the idea of generating community interest and energy to do more investigation, to figure out the needs are, to figure out others who have similar interests so we can pull resources and get things done. And so I you know, really appreciate that. Thank you, Diego. Um, any other uh, final uh, questions as we uh, start to wrap up here? Please, again, if you asked one earlier, uh, resubmit it in the chat because I, it's hard to follow. Wilma Rhodes, consider, oh yes, and also consider submitting your own project uh, enhancement idea. These are for existing Aperio projects, new ideas for projects. That's a whole different kind of workflow. And we have our farm site. <laughs> nice comment, Diego. Uh, uh, will we see any of these presentations on Aperio farm new development? It's an interesting idea, Wilma. We could. Uh, take a, a link to this video, a link maybe we I have a copy of these presentations. Um, not all of them have uh, slides, but we could take what we've got and potentially if everyone, all the presenters are okay with it and, and publish them there. We could definitely post the videos and, and Matt writes, uh, oh, he's writing to Louisa, okay, cool. And Martin's good with posting him, so excellent. So yeah, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, and don't forget we have a voting site, so we'll send out some more information maybe for the newsletter would be good. That's actually just struck my mind right now is that for the Perio newsletter, what I'll do is write up a, a brief paragraph or two to remind everyone of like, where do you go with your ideas? So we have the place you post the ideas, um, and if your project isn't already listed there, it's very easy for uh, our, our farm team to set that up. So you have a place to, for people to post ideas, um, to vote on ideas. Um, we're doing these lightning talks as a way to, to raise awareness. We have a farm team and we're available to help you brainstorm ideas for how to you know, get resources or find out if um, there are other interested people in the community, interested in institutions in the community that might be willing to partner with you. Uh, that's it's sort of in a way like farm and another way is like a matchmaking service trying to find the people who might be interested with the people who have the ideas so we can make these things happen. Um, uh, Jennifer writes, not sure I get the Aperio newsletter. Is there a sign up page? Uh, yes, Jennifer, I'll make sure to send that out uh, to the Sakai and um, the project list. There is a separate 
uh, sign up. It's if you would have to, most people I thought, I was assuming, were on announcements at aperio.org, right? So Jim put it exactly right in the chat, which is that announcements at aperio.org. Highly recommend everyone sign up for that. It's where the newsletter is for the Aperio. It's where other announcements to the Aperio go. Um, and then there's an open at aperio.org, which is just for totally open discussion about anything related to, you know, higher ed and technology open source stuff, you know, like a water cooler. And thank you, Andrew, for pasting that link. That would be also a good thing to remind people in the uh, announcement, although I, you know, then the announcement won't uh, probably need a broader communications effort since people who aren't already on the announcements list won't get the newsletter to, to see that that's some of the options. Um, Bruce mentions Image Quiz has a new listserv. So you, if you're interested in contacting Bruce directly, he has his email there. And uh, so, and uh, Jim's posting a list to all the, the lists, all the Google groups for Aperio. So this seems like a really good way to uh, wrap up. Does anyone else have any final uh, thoughts, comments, or requests for the uh, community? It sounds like not for the moment. It is being recorded, Didi. I'm going to post the recording for sure. So thank you, everybody. Uh, it was uh, really, uh, really enjoyed it quite a bit. Martin, yes, we, we're hoping to make this like a semi-regular thing where we can share these ideas and have these great discussions. So thanks so, so much for everyone's participation, both the presenters and the participants. Um, you all made it a really great uh, session. So I'm going to end the recording now and take care, y'all.